Hello, I'm Lindsay with Emerge Ortho. I'm joined again today by Dr. Tom Skerritt, general surgeon. Today, we're going to be talking about acid reflux or GERD. Um, before I jump into the frequently asked questions that he gets from his patients all the time, Dr. Skerritt, help me out. I know I get uh, uh, heartburn a lot at night. Is there anything I could be doing to alleviate that? Yeah, so nighttime heartburn is very common. Um, the easiest ways to help alleviate that are just with behavior modification, trying to limit what you eat close to bedtime. Um, you can elevate the head of your bed or like sleep on a pillow just to give yourself a little bit of an incline. Um, those are those are kind of the basic things that can help. Um, beyond that, you know, I would say this to anyone is run this by your PCP, see if see if it's right to get on a, a heartburn medication for you and see if that's the the route that you need to go down. I need to get myself one of those wedge things to sleep on. <laughs> yep, that can help. Okay, uh, let's jump into our frequently asked questions. Uh, okay, so first, what is GERD? So GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, and if you break that down, it describes exactly what we're talking about. Gastro, stomach, esophageal, esophagus, and reflux. So basically, it's where um, contents in the stomach reflux into the esophagus. And most commonly, this is going to be acid. Um, and that's what we think of when we think about typical acid reflux, heartburn. Um, you can also get non-acid reflux. You can just get, you know, food contents. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit when we get into some of the symptoms and how we diagnose and test for GERD. Um, so it's not always acid, but it does, it does imply that things from the stomach are finding their way back into the esophagus. Okay. So yeah, talk to me about some of the symptoms. Yeah, so you talked about heartburn. I think that's one of the most common ones, but we can also see people presenting in, in some different ways. They may just have difficulty swallowing or a sensation that food gets stuck when they try mm -hmm. to swallow. Um, they may have regurgitation. They may, like, they may notice food coming up into the back of their throat. Um, and they may notice bad breath. These are all things that can, can help clue into a diagnosis of GERD. Okay, yeah, I've definitely had some of those other symptoms as well. I didn't connect them. Does everyone who has heartburn have GERD? Not necessarily. Heartburn is kind of a vague reported symptom where you have, you know, a burning sensation in this area. And obviously, you know, just from the name, we know that heartburn can actually be attributed to cardiac issues. It can be, certainly can be reflux. It can be attributed to an ulcer. Um, so just having heartburn is usually an indication for more of a workup to figure out exactly what's causing it. Okay, good to know. So how is GERD typically treated? Uh, so typically it is treated with things that we talked about earlier, behavior modification and medication, most specifically proton pump inhibitors. Mm -hmm. um, but since you're talking to me about this, obviously surgery is also an option for patients who have GERD. Typically the patients that we see in, in preparation for surgery or those who have symptoms that are difficult to control, like they're taking medication and it's just not helping, or they're younger patients looking at being on a proton pump inhibitor for a long time. And we're starting to see more and more data that really long-term use of PPIs may not be ideal. And some of these patients may be better off having an anti-reflux surgery early on rather than staying on these medications for years and years and years. Right, that makes sense. Um, okay, so which tests diagnose GERD, and do I need to have every test? Yeah, so I'm going to answer that in a little different way and kind of how do I, as a surgeon, what tests do I perform to decide what I'm going to operate, when I'm going to operate, and, and what operation I'm going to do. Okay. Um, so people with reflux, I think everyone with reflux should get an upper endoscopy where either a surgeon or a gastroenterologist goes in with a camera, looking at the esophagus, looking at the stomach. I think this one's really important to look at the esophagus for signs of damage. Um, we know that long-term reflux can cause damage to the esophagus, and that's something that we want to uh, want to rule out or detect early on in the process. So that's that's really the first test. Um, the second one that I typically get is a, a upper GI swallow study, where we have you drink some contrast and take pictures. This is great at giving a dynamic picture of your swallowing. Um, sometimes you can even see the contrast reflux up on that study, and that's a great way to say, all right, well, we just we ha now have radiographic evidence of reflux. Uh, it also gives me some clues about the anatomy. When we talk about kind of things that cause GERD, 
we know that having a hiatal hernia where part of your stomach herniates through the diaphragm up into your chest, it can certainly lead to reflux. Um, and this is a great test in addition to the upper endoscopy at showing me whether you have one of those hernias because that can certainly play a role in, in our surgical options. Um, and then the third test that I get on everyone is what's called esophageal manometry. It's probably the least pleasant of these. They have to place a probe into your esophagus and have you swallow water. It's also one of the most important for me as a surgeon when I'm doing your surgical planning because it tells me how well your esophagus functions. And the function of your esophagus can really change the type of surgery that I do. Um, it can even change the diagnosis from GERD to, to esophageal dysmotility disorders that can lead us down a whole different path of treatment. So while not always pleasant, I think it's an imperative test to get. Um, there are other tests that we can obtain. Those three are the ones that I would say are necessary. Um, a lot of times you'll also hear people talk about pH testing or impedance testing. And this is another probe that they place in the esophagus and that measures uh, the pH of fluid that's coming up into the esophagus, which is great for diagnosing acid reflux. Um, and if you get impedance testing, it can actually test for non-acid reflux as well. I typically reserve that test for people who don't quite fit a good clinical picture that makes me say, yes, you have, you have GERD and an anti-reflux operation is right for you. So if the other three tests have still left things a little up in the air and your symptoms just don't quite add up, that's usually when I'll pursue getting that pH or impedance testing. Okay, makes sense. Um, so talk a little bit about the surgical procedures that you use to treat GERD. Yeah, so surgery for, uh, for reflux and by its nature, surgery for hiatal hernias go hand in hand. Um, typically what, what they fall under is the category of fundiplications, where we, if you think of the stomach as kind of a big floppy bag, we take some of the excess stomach and actually wrap it around the esophagus where it joins the stomach. And this helps form a little valve so that when you eat and drink, that valve helps keep, keep, um, keep stomach contents from going back into the esophagus. The okay. most common one is the Nissen fund application where we take the stomach and wrap it all the way around uh, 360 degrees around the esophagus. And this is where that esophageal manometry comes into play because if you have a poor functioning esophagus, which is very common in patients who've had longstanding reflux, giving you this full wrap can actually be detrimental to your swallowing. Mm -hmm. So in these cases, I actually would be more likely to perform what's called a partial wrap. Um, there are different techniques for doing this. The one that I typically use is called a toupee fund application, where I just wrap that excess part of the stomach around the backside of the esophagus about 180 to 270 degrees rather than that full 360. And that does a good job at preventing reflux with a little less impact on your swallowing. But those are really the, the main surgical options um, when we talk about treatment for reflux. Okay. There are, there are um, a couple other techniques, usually not ones that I do, but you may come across these such as the Lynx device, uh, as well as some endoscopic techniques that help as well. Um, but the fun application is the, is the classic and that's usually what I go with. What does the recovery time from surgery look like and what sort of changes should I anticipate in my day to day? Yeah, so, so all of these surgeries can be done and should be done laparoscopically. Um, that is the, the most common approach. So the recovery from these operations itself is actually not that bad. It's a big operation, but it's done through little incisions and usually within a, about a couple weeks, most of the soreness is, has resolved and you're feeling pretty much back to normal. The big change is what you touched on is kind of behavior modification moving forward. Obviously, after this, after we do this wrap, it's going to impact your swallowing as the tissues are swollen from surgery. And so it will improve over time, but definitely expect for the first several weeks to be on a liquid diet and then slowly advance to, to start to add pureed food and then, you know, some soft, more solid food before you're really getting back to back to a normal diet. That process can really take up to two months. Of, of getting you back to a normal diet. Okay, so that's actually all the FAQs I have. Is there anything else that you typically tell your patients um, when they're considering this type of treatment? I think we covered it. You know, most of the questioning and most of my time counseling patients is involved um, in talking about the, the tests that we perform. So I think we got to spend some time talking about that and hopefully answered some of those questions ahead of time so they'll understand kind of what, what workup they're looking at when they walk in to talk about this surgery.
Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Skerritt. Um, okay, so for viewers, I have uh, linked Dr. Skerritt's bio in the description of this video. You can use that link to learn more about him, his specialty areas. You can also use it to request an appointment with him. Thanks so much for watching this video, and we'll catch you next time.